Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to our panel. Um, so for this morning, my presenters decided to go the asynchronous route. Um, and we are going to be playing all five panelists recordings uh, back to back. They've been curated for your viewing pleasure. And then I will present at the end and then we will open for Q&A. Thank you so much everybody for being here so early in the morning. I hope that these panels, um, these papers are informative. All right, so I'm going to um, share my screen. One moment. Can everybody Good morning. hear? Okay. I'm Dr. Christina Davidson, and I'm coming to you from Washington University in St. Louis. To begin, I would like to thank Sofia Monegro for organizing this panel. The title of my talk today is Black Sovereignty as Spiritual Crusade, African-American Migrants, Missionaries, and Ministers in 19th Century Dominican History. Um, and the main point I would like to get across is that Black Protestant religious history is not just a source of docu documenting African-American immigration, but also a source of theorization. So let me begin. Within the first two decades after the Haitian Revolution, thousands of African-Americans left the United States to become citizens of the Black Republic, Haiti. To date, most scholarship on the early Haitian immigration movement of the 1820s has focused on the political aspirations of African Americans without necessarily centering their Protestant Christian worldview. Yet, as scholar Laurie Muffley Kipp has argued, the hope that Haiti symbolized was at once political and deeply spiritual. When black abolitionists petitioned the United States government for US recognition of Haiti in the decades after 1804, they did so out of religious devotion to a Christian God who they believed abhorred slavery and acted on behalf of the Haitian insurrectionist and soon would do the same for enslaved people in the United States. Immigrants, who scholars have described as political pilgrims who held fast to political philosophy of racial equality and freedom, fled the United States for Haiti as religious pilgrims inspired by a political theology that espoused racial equality and abolition. This religious worldview originated in the 18th century anti-slavery movement, which, as Lehman Sana has written, quote, had its roots in evangelical doctrine concerning the possibility of instant personal salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit, end quote. Drawing from the same evangelical social activism, that carried U.S. Black clergy and congregations to Nova Scotia, Sierra Leone, and Liberia in the 1770s and 1780s, immigrants to Haiti in the early decades of the 1800s saw themselves as exodusers leaving the mainland house of bondage for God's divinely ordained Black promised land and redeemers out to transform a Haitian Eden. Social ties to abolitionists remain strong um, in the case of Haitian immigration. Like the British founder of Methodism, John Wesley, who had encouraged US black immigrants to go to Nova Scotia, the British abolitionist, William Wilberforce, prompted the black immigrationist, Prince Saunders, to establish schools in Haiti. Saunders spent years in Haiti promoting education, immigration, and Protestantism. And he uh, was the son of the black abolitionist and wealthy merchant, Paul Coffey, who helped uh, found the Sierra Leone colony. colony. So we can begin to see how uh, the immigrants who went to Haiti were embedded in these Protestant Atlantic world networks. So elsewhere, I have argued that the political and religious aspects of black immigration to Haiti unite in the early history of, Afri of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. As the first independent black Protestant denomination in the United States, the AME Church was born from the, Haitian, the, excuse me, the radical Christian spirit, the same radical Christian spirit of the abolitionist movement and the uh, revolutionary spirit of the Haitian Revolution. Within the AME Church, whole families, 
in individual lay members, clergy, and even Richard Allen's son. Uh, Richard Allen was the founder and first member, or sorry, first bishop of the AME Church. They all found common cause with Haiti. They immigrated from the United States not only to flee uh, slavery in the U.S. South and racial prejudice in the North, but also because of their radical religious convictions nurtured in African Methodism that demanded their movement. The Black pilgrims who left family and friends behind to settle in Haiti did not disappear, even if references to them remain scant in print literature. Although maintaining communication with families uh, and churches in the United States proved difficult, colonists recreated Protestant societies on the island in order to sustain their faith and group cohesion. African Methodist records, for example, show that by 1830, immigrant communities in Samana and Santo Domingo had organized well enough to form or to hold an annual conference, a yearly meeting of two or more Methodist congregations. During the conference, they elected Isaac Miller of Samana and Jacob Roberts of Santo Domingo to represent their societies at the 1830 Baltimore Annual Conference. The ministers carried to Baltimore letters from their uh, respective congregations that provide further glimpses into immigrants' religious lives. The society at Samana had a board of trustees, which included the exhorters Samuel Thatcher, class leaders Charles Irwin, and four other male members. These leaders declared Miller their, quote, guardian angel, who in the Holy War stood the storm and appears willing to endeavor until the end. This religious language portrayed the migration process as a holy crusade ordained by God. The Baltimore Conference received Roberts and Miller into the AME connection, set the two ministers apart for ordination, and licensed them to return to the island as soon as possible. And at least one other member of the Baltimore Conference, Samuel Ent, uh, volunteered to go with them. Now, for reasons that I cover elsewhere, um, the Amy Church was not able to maintain its connection to uh, the island in these early years. And by 1841, the denomination declared its missions in Haiti to be lost. Um, and it would not reestablish official missionary stations until after 1865, as we know, coinciding with uh, the US Civil War and the Dominican War of Restoration. The Amy Church, however, was not the only Protestant denomination to establish missionary churches and forge, forge ties with black immigrant communities on Hispaniola. Prior to the mass immigration movement of the 1820s, the Society of Friends, the American Baptist Church, and the British Wesley Methodist Church all sent missionaries to the island with the aim of converting Haitians. Of these groups, the Wesleyans developed the strongest ties with black immigrants formerly associated with the AME Church in the United States. Immigrants in the towns of uh, Puerto Plata and Samana petitioned the Wesleyans for aid. In 1832, for example, 22, excuse me, 24 African-American immigrants in Puerto Plata representing themsel themselves and a community of 30 women and 60 children informed the London Missionary Society that they had met its agent, Theophilus Pooh, stationed in the Turks Islands and requested the society to send another missionary to Puerto Plata. The Wesleyan uh, Society sent John Tyndall uh, to Puerto Plata in 1834. Nevertheless, um, excuse me, <laughs> uh, what I wanna say is that what we begin to see here, um, and it, as we know from the works of uh, George Lockwood, for example, um, that as the AME church, uh, his ties, with these communities begin to thin or wane in the 1840s, the British Wesley ministers institu instituted a missionary circuit on Hispaniola that linked uh, the island's uh, northern port towns, uh, Samana, Puerto Plata, uh, Cape Haitian, to the Turks and Caicos Islands and to other islands of the British Caribbean. Now this Wesleyan circuit created a new network of black Protestant communities on the island, uh, which endured throughout the 19th century despite the island's division into two nations in 1844. Now these circuits um, serve as the basis of my research uh, connecting black Protestantism in the Dominican Republic to the British Caribbean and the United States. So uh, in the few minutes I have left, um, 
what lessons might be drawn from understanding this early history of migration of migrants, missionaries, and ministers, or as uh, Sofia Monegro has tasked us to answer, what work is there left to be done in the historic immigration of African Americans to Haiti? And I want to offer uh, five points. First, uh, the first lesson to underscore is the importance of religious history, not just as a source of documentation, but also as a site of theorization. The understanding um, the immigration movement as a spiritual crusade um, more accurately reflects a worldview in which the immigrants that the immigrants themselves held. What would it mean, for example, to write history from their vantage point in which understandings of freedom are embedded within a black Christianity that spanned the Atlantic world? Second, there is a tendency in narrating this immigration history to elide the mid and late 19th century, as well as most of the 20th century. Uh, in other words, in popular discourse, we tend to look at the Haitian immigration movement and then quickly fast forward to present day without much analysis of what lies in between. Now, I and my co-panelists are working to change this practice. And for the 19th century in particular, we need more studies such as uh, Gerald Horn's Confronting the Black Jacobins, which embeds African-American immig immigrants within um, the broader milieu of Haitian and Dominican society. Now, when doing so, and this is my third point, it is imperative uh, that as scholars, we center the worldview of the immigrants themselves. And that means a greater attention to the history of black Protestant Christianity in the Dominican Republic over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. In other words, uh, we need to build upon George Lockwood's early studies of Dominican Protestantism. Um, and so to do that, there is a note um, that I'm making here about method. Uh, we need to carefully not only read church documents and institutional histories, but also uh, U.S. Do uh, government documents and travel narratives um, for understandings of religious worldviews. For example, in 1845 and 1847, uh, U.S. agents John Hogan and David Dixon Porter uh, both com commented somewhat derisively about the immigrants and their religious devotion. And the same could be said of uh, Jane Cousineau and Julia um, Ward Ho at mid-century, as well as the 1871 U.S. Commission Report, uh, just to name a few 19th century examples. And so uh, the fifth and final point is that we must consider a change over time. Uh, why is it, for example, that African-American immigrants in Samana support U.S. annexation in 1871? Do their religious worldviews play a role? Um, how does religious difference impact Dominicans of African-American descent at the end of the 19th century under uh, Ulysses Aro's regime and into the 20th century as the U.S. becomes dominant and ultimately occupies the island? What happens to these groups? So, let me get created a new network Ulysses Aro's regime and into the 20th century as the U.S. becomes dominant and ultimately occupies the island. What happens to these groups? So let me conclude by saying there is much work to be done, uh, but it's also exciting work that is already being done uh, and is reflected in this panel. And I am very grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it. Um, so please stay tuned uh, to my forthcoming book tentatively entitled uh, Converting Española, Religious Race Making in the Dominican Americas, where I explore some of these questions and others. And thank you again to uh, Sofia Monegro, to my co-panelists, and to the organizers of this year's virtual DSA conference. Today I'll be talking about migration to Haiti in the 1820s and the overview for the paper is I'll be examining in detail the prehistory and I'll be looking at the Haitian leaders perspective. Now scholars have long focused on the Haitian Revolution was that nation's key contribution to debates on slavery and abolition in the Atlantic world. 
but this scholarly attention has had the effect of muting another powerful signal from the Caribbean island, the emergence of Haiti as a black nation, and how it influenced the free black population of the United States. When rebels in Saint-Domingue fought for and won freedom from slavery and colonialism, they directly challenged ideas of white supremacy. When they founded and governed their own state, they again undermined that view of the world by challenging the notion that freed slaves and free people of color were incapable of sustaining independence. With the revolution, they changed the paradigm of possibilities for militant slaves. Through independence, they did the same for politicized free blacks. The establishment and progress of Haiti as an independent black nation marked a political and cultural milestone in the African diaspora. In the 1810s and 1820s, Haitian and African-American leaders actively promoted the island as a quintessentially black nation. Haitian leaders did so by codifying the concept in the nation's constitution and also by other words and deeds. At independence, Haiti identified itself by color, declaring in Article 14 of its constitution, Haitians henceforth will be known by the generic name of blacks. Around the same time, the African-American community began to look to the Caribbean island and embracing their color as an identifier as well. This choice, just as in Haiti, was a strategy to unify against white oppression and racism. Yet in both cases, emerging black identity was not based on an essentialist or biological notion of difference, but was characterized by shared goals of unity, autonomy, and freedom from white rule. Haitians had embraced these goals in their foundational texts and laws, and African Americans increasingly believed that these goals could only be obtained in a black rule dominion separated from white control in a place like Haiti. Posterity has not been kind to Haiti's first generation of leaders. Some have characterized these men as originating the economic and political morass into which their country later slid. Leading the first nation in the world to throw off slave shackles and only the second to achieve independence from colonialism, their achievements should be considered in light of the tools available and the hostility of the international community. These leaders were aware that Haiti's independence and nationhood were symbols of racial uplift and proof of racial equality, but also aware that world opinion and economic viability were crucial to its fortunes. Early leaders actively worked to bring African Americans to the island as part of their nation building efforts and as a way to assist their colored brothers and sisters in the United States facing racial and economic hardships. When Dessa Liam proclaimed Haiti's independence in 1804, he began the process of transforming the former colony into a nation. As a two product slave state governed by a tiny elite, Saint Domingue bequeathed few institutions or foundations to the new nation. Moving the society towards nationhood posed an enormous challenge because the issues of land and labor remained unresolved. Despite the revolution and the overthrow of French rule and slave labor, the plantation continued to be the economic model Haitian leaders reverted to in order to make their nation rich, powerful, and respected. But ordinary Haitians, most of whom were former slaves, rejected this program of growing a cash crop of plantation-type labor. Seeing their hopes for a respected, recognized, and secure Haiti jeopardized by this refusal, but unable to reimpose the plantation labor system wholesale, leaders of Haiti turned to the United States, the black community there. Each of Haiti's early leaders looked to these potential black settlers to bring labor, skills, and capital to aid the building of the Haitian nation. Another challenge that faced Haiti was that the population had been decimated by a 13-year war. By some accounts, one-third to one-half the population had died or fled the island. Another 100,000 to 130,000 were permanently disabled. After 13 years of war, habits and work had diminished among the population as well. Women who had worked in the fields as slaves continued to fill that role of their independence, comprising two-thirds of the population. Their labor remained essential to the island's productivity. But they too abandoned this type of manual labor, becoming Haiti's small-scale marketers and traders. 
as we see here in this image. Desalene, realizing he needed to do something to improve Haiti's agricultural output, turned to American blacks. These Americans would bolster Haiti's population, add new laborers, secure skilled manpower, and supply additional military personnel against a possible foreign invasion. He advertised northern-based American newspapers and offered $40 to ship captains for every man transported to the island. Northern cities were growing quickly, and the free black population was growing with them. Although no evidence indicates that Desalene successfully implemented his proposals, this project of importing population would be revisited by his successors. Upon his death and the subsequent split up of the country, these issues continued to dull Christophe and Petion. To increase productivity, Christophe and Petion reimposed labor laws first introduced by literature in the 1790s to keep workers productive. We know a great deal about Christophe because he carried on correspondence with Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce. Understanding the predicament Christophe faced, Clarkson suggested a version of Desalines' project to alleviate the kingdom's woes, African-American immigration. In the letter explaining his idea, Clarkson enumerated the many advantages African-American settlement would give to the kingdom, including strengthening the king's position at home and in the eyes of foreigners, and of France in particular. Luckily, Christophe could, could turn to Prince Saunders, Here's an image of Clarkson and Wilberforce. Prince Saunders, a native of the United States, to promote his plan. Saunders was one of the first Northern African-American civic and intellectual leaders to live in Haiti. Worked as a Boston school teacher before moving to the kingdom in 1816. Saunders, because of, his, because of his American background and ties to the black American community, excelled at promoting Haiti in the United States. He toured the United States speaking to various African American groups. These talks seemed successful. Saunders, in a report to Christoph, claimed thousands were prepared to immigrate from New England and the middle states. Satisfied with Saunders' results, Christoph donated ships and $25,000 to the project. However, before the immigration scheme could begin, the king died. And with his death, the project to augment Haiti's population and labor systems with American settlers ended too. Meanwhile, the population in the Republic and the labor shortages there continued to worry Petion. He turned to the United States as a resource as well, and he hoped to strengthen his military defenses. He requested that men of color come to Haiti and reminded his audience in his newspaper advertising that freedom and prosperity could be found nowhere else but in Haiti. Pointing to the Haitian Constitution, a document that, quote, consecrate all your rights, Petion urged those living in America to come and share the benefits of these laws in the new nation. Petion, throughout his presidency, invited settlers with open arms and urged Americans to abandon an ungrateful country that failed to appreciate them. He described settling in Haiti as a political act that would show, quote, white men that there yet exists colored and black men who can raise a fearless front, secured from insult and from injury. He also promised the immigrants little difference in our manner of living from that of the places they shall leave encouraging a belief that the Republic was a sort of black United States that offered its citizen un universal manhood, suffrage, religious freedom, a constitutional republic, and a maturing capitalist society. Throughout African American history, economic gain has been understood as a community issue, in addition to being a matter of personal motivation. Too often in the U.S., basic economic rights were denied African Americans because of their skin color. Petion understood this and advertised the economic opportunities in the Republic. A skilled worker, he promised, could expect to make six to twelve dollars a week, while farmers would receive two to four dollars a week. He made clear his desire for Americans with disposable capital, capital pledging returns on investments in commerce or in cultivation at fifty percent per annum 
He also assured laborers as well as sailors that they were in great demand. For those who have no means, Petian promised to pay their passages, offering $40 for adult men and $20 for children. We know one black New Yorker who took up this offer and moved to Haiti, remaining there throughout the 1820s. How many New Yorkers joined in this 1817 settlement is unknown. Petion died in the spring of 1818 of natural causes, leaving Boyer his successor to finish the project. As president, Boyer reiter reiterated the offers made by Petion to African Americans requesting that artisans, farmers, and industrious men of any profession settle in Haiti, pledging that migrants who worked as cultivators would find very advantageous position, receiving from two to four dollars per week in addition to room and board. Boyer sweetened the pot by promising title to these lands after one year of cultivation. And he followed Christophe's method of presenting immigration in person to African Americans. In the summer of 1824, he sent Jonathan Granville to tour and give lectures throughout the northern United States. Granville's tour was instrumental in attracting the large number of settlers and the support of leaders such as Richard Allen and Peter Williams. Boyer also published his, his project widely in U.S. newspapers. And uh, some of the quotes from these newspapers were arguing that the guiding hand of Providence has destined Haiti for a land of promise. Boyer presented immigration to Haiti as more than just an opportunity. It was sanctioned by God. For those estimated six to 13,000 African Americans who answered Boyer's call and who left the United States to settle in Haiti, it would be a a true test of their affiliation to Haiti and the idea of a black nation. It would remain to be seen if these promises would be kept and that they would be with open arms. And the opportunities for skilled laborers and farmers would materialize. But that portion of African American immigration will have to wait for another time. So we're asked to look at and try to answer this question of how does the historic immigration uh, unsettle our understanding of traditional migration flows. So I think that's uh, just the existence that this is known that people were leaving the United States out of anger, out of uh, disappointment and seeking new lands is, uh, I remember telling the family members, friends who were not historians about this. I'm like, what? People left the United States? And uh, so I think this is um, a complete repudiation of the idea of the United States as this uh, beacon of hope for everybody because it wasn't. And so I think Haitian immigration shows that that is definitely the case. So I, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you. In January of 1871, Frederick Douglass, the famed African-American abolitionist and civil rights warrior, joined his fellow commission members in a cadre of journalists and scientists aboard the USS Tennessee as the ship set sail for the Dominican Republic. President Ulysses S. Grant had named Douglas Assistant Secretary to the Santo Domingo Commission, which Grant had charged with assessing the social, political, and economic conditions of Santo Domingo and ascertaining if the Dominican people wished to be annexed to the United States. While on the island, Douglas met with the American colonists at Samana, a group of African Americans and their Dominican-born descendants who came to the Dominican Republic in the 1820s when the entire island was united under the government of Haitian President Jean-Pierre Boyer. When Douglas asked, what are the opinions and feelings of the people concerning annexation to the United States? 
They replied, we do not know a man here who is not in favor of it. This scene was repeated later when colonists Elijah R. Gross and a group from the Society of the Bible were similarly questioned in Santo Domingo. Gross, who had come from Philadelphia with the American colony 45 years earlier, replied, we are in unanimous favor of U.S. annexation. Furthermore, Gross characterized the prospect of annexation as, quote, an act of humanity and an invaluable blessing. Why would African Americans who had fled the United States decades before to escape discrimination and racial violence and their Dominican born descendant, descendants advocate for the annexation of the Dominican Republic to the United States and in such an enthusiastic fashion? My talk, but now the United States is a country of freedom, African Americans, Dominicans of African American descent and annexation attempts to answer these two questions. The research comes from my book manuscript, Advocating for Others, African Americans, the Island of Hispaniola and the Fight for Racial Democracy, 1869 to 1965, which examines African American thought about and adv advocacy for the Island of Hispaniola and all its inhabitants in the context of a Jim Crow US empire. In my brief comments today, I will argue that the search for economic opportunity and fair treatment as people of color led African-American immigrants and their Dominican-born descendants to advocate for U.S. annexation for themselves and the Dominican population as a whole. African-Americans and Dominicans of African descent interviewed by members of the Santo Domingo Commission frequently argued that annexation to the United States could provide the political stability the nation needed for Dominicans to prosper economically. Theodore Hall, a 62-year-old boarding house owner and one of the first immigrants to come to the country, complained that whenever there were troubles, men were called off to war and that, and that when, quote, the men would get to work and make a little money, they would be called away to war again. Unfortunately, this meant that women found themselves tasked with taking care of the family farm and crops would often rot. In essence, he argued that the frequent conflicts that plagued the island between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, between various factions in the Dominican Republic, and later the War of Restoration, endangered the economic well being of Dominican families. As a result, Hall believed that, quote, every man who had suffered in that way, nearly everyone, was in favor of annexation. Joseph P. Hamilton, an African American Dominican, picked up on this same thread. Born outside of the Dominican capital in 1827 to parents from Philadelphia, by 1871, Hamilton had become a Methodist preacher, living and preaching amongst the Black American colonists of Samana. He framed discussions of annexation to the United States as going back a dozen years or more. At the moment of his interview, he described annexation as, quote, all of their, de their dependents, both those who came here from the United States and the natives suggesting support amongst African-Americans, their island-born children, and the general Dominican population. He asserted that, quote, when a man labored and labored and labored and found it all in vain, when revolutions and troubles were constantly in the country, destroying all he gets, that a time would come when he must be disgusted and he would renounce his own nationality for the sake of security, that his labor might produce something. As a descendant of African Americans who came to Hispaniola from the United States to seek better opportunities, who had married a woman from the same background, Hamilton no doubt understood this predicament. Moreover, he related his life in the Dominican Republic, where a series of political disturbances from 1858 through 1865 had constantly wrecked the fruits of his labor. Thus he opined, opined there is no security now. General Theophilus James, also a descendant of African Americans and resident of Samana, argued something similar. Having traveled extensively throughout the Dominican Republic's northern regions, he felt he could speak on behalf of Black American colonists and Dominicans. He expressed to the commission that he believed the Dominicans were, quote, in favor of annexation of the country to the United States. Strongly so. Why? According to him, people desired annexation to the United States for, quote, the sake of peace and tranquility. 
that each man may enjoy what he earned by his labor. He and others did not wish for a handout, quote, for any foreign power to come in with a sack of doubloons to put in every man's pocket, but rather they wanted to be able to work with the prospect of enjoying the fruits of that work, which they could not do under the present circumstances. Equally important, African Americans and their Dominican descendants framed their support for annexation to the U.S. As, desirable, as a desirable alternative to the recently ended annexation of the Dominican Republic to Spain, which had been tinned with racial prejudice and the threat of the reintroduction to, of slavery. In 1861, when President Pedro Santana announced the annexation of the Dominican Republic to Spain, he and his allies highlighted the benefits that would supposedly come as Spanish capital flowed to the island. Despite such promises, historian Ann Eller has shown that opposition to annexation ran deep amongst African-descended Dominicans, particularly because the Spanish, who came to implement annexation, hailed from Cuba and Puerto Rico, where plantation slavery still existed and racial discrimination had deep roots. Spanish officials, military leaders, and common soldiers from these neighboring islands could barely hide their disdain for the free African-descended majority or the Black American colonists at Samaná and Puerto Plata. As a result, the movement that expelled the Spanish from the island, the War of Restoration, had strong anti-slavery and anti-racist undertones. The aforementioned Joseph P. Hamilton spoke to the outgrowth of the Spanish attitude as he talked to the commission about interactions between the Cuban and Puerto Rican newcomers and average Dominicans. He told them that, quote, the Spaniards maltreated the poor colored people. People would come down to town with things to sell and the Spaniards would take them at the price they chose to pay. The people were ignorant and frightened and took it, but they said, if it is that way now, what will it be by and by? In Hamilton's comment, we can see an intertwining of race and economics, where the haughty attitudes and actions of Cuban and Puerto Rican Spaniards threatened the economic well-being of poor Dominicans of color, at least some of whom felt powerless to challenge the Spanish and worried that the situation might deteriorate even further. No doubt, such instances provided ample fodder for concerns about racial discrimination and the reestablishment of slavery. When Hamilton's remembrances of Spanish unification are placed alongside the comments of others who favored union to the U.S., the second reason that Black American colonists and their descendants supported annexation emerges. Not only could the U.S. offer economic step that offer the stability needed for economic prosperity, but in the aftermath of the U.S. Civil War and the end of slavery, uh, the United States, unlike Spain, had made steps towards establishing racial equality. Reverend Jacob James, the older brother of General Theophilus James, had come to the island in 1825 with his parents as a young child. Now 48 years of age, he was in charge of the 250-member African Methodist Episcopal Church in Samana. He framed discussions of annexation to the U.S. going back further than his brother, telling the commission why this thing has been talked of here for 20 years. James continued noting that, quote, when General Santana was in power before he announced reunification with Spain, we wanted annexation to the U.S. and hoped for it but some objections to it would be raised then because then the United States was a slave holding country. But now the United States is a country of freedom. We all know this and we all want to join the United States. My research findings presented here today highlight the ways in which African-Americans and their Dominican born descendants attempted to use their voices before the Santo Domingo Commission to advocate for Dominican annexation with an eye towards increased economic opportunity and racial equality for themselves and Dominicans during the brief window of time when it looked as if the United States might become a racial democracy before the end of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow. As such, it is part of a larger body of research needed to better understand the historic relationship between African Americans and Dominicans, which many assume is rooted in animosity when in fact, there is a long history of positive relationships spanning the spectrum from seeking mutual understanding to cooperation to advocacy that my research and the research of my co-panelists highlights.
My name is Ryan Mann Hamilton. I'm a professor of anthropology at CUNY LaGuardia. Uh, much of my research has been on the history and culture of Samana, looking at the long history. My name is Ryan Mann Hamilton. I'm a professor of anthropology at CUNY LaGuardia. Uh, much of my research has been on the history and culture of Samana, looking at the long history of struggle of the African American migration and African American community in Samana, and thinking through some of the dynamics uh, of that process. For a long time, I have been enamored with the history of Samana, not only because it connects to my own family history, right, one of an African American migration to the Caribbean, in this case, to the uh, Republic of Haiti, but also because it looks at, that own family history looks at connections to Cuba, to St. Croix, to other locations across the Caribbean as well, right? And migrations that happen in the aftermath of that. It's not unique at all. It's actually quite, uh, it's quite natural that in these coastal spaces across Caribbean, um, there was much more connection to other locations rather than to the interior areas of the, of the country itself. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the period of rule under Balaguer, Joaquin Balaguer, uh, and really specifically the period of 1970 to 1974, which I think about as a moment of upheaval in the community itself, uh, a moment of dislocation, dispossession, and displacement uh, through a long-term process, right, emanating uh, on behalf of the Dominican state. I would like to start the presentation with a quote by Siriaco Stubbs, a member of the Samana community and director of the Music Academy for a long time. Samana was a paradise. Here we grew what we harvested. We ate it here. Samana was prosperous, produced organic agriculture because here we didn't use any pesticide. We just waited for the times of rain, the right times when we would plant. We waited for nature to tell us when. Here the people used to be united and people knew each other. We would organize parties and pageants, lots of beautiful things. It is no longer like that. I liked Samana then. When I saw the disaster they, they being the state, had caused, they finished with everything. Now you see houses, but they demolished everything. Before the destruction, folks would gather every Sunday after 7 p.m. in the park in front of the Catholic Church. The musicians would start playing and the couples would come out to dance. It became a tradition. They would play merengue, romantic music, the foxtrot, any type of music. But all that was, all that was put to an end. The streets were small then, but one could breathe a fresh air. All the homes had gardens and trees and the heat wasn't felt as much. Now everything is in cement. Um, Siriaco himself was born in Samana to a family of musicians that emigrated from the islands of Turks and Caicos. Siriaco was one of the last directors of the Samana Municipal uh, Music Academy. His band, Siriaco y los Muchachos, represented the peninsula in national music competitions. Music was part of his family's legacy, but also reflected the longstanding support of music bands and teaching academies in Samana prior to the town's destruction. The destruction that, uh, that Siriaco referred to was the culmination of the Dominican state's modernization project, which brought about the complete displacement and renovation and transformation of the town of Samana from 1971 to 73. The changes precipitated by this structural transformation and renovation of the town resulted in a decimated civil society and a population that held very little power over the local structures of governance. The dislocation of neighborhood power structures and social networks dismantled and disrupted everyday life. As a result, many of the town's more established families and businesses were forced to leave and began leaving Samana. Like many other community elders, Siriaco understood the destruction and renovation of the town as an unnecessary act. Having been designated as one of the three major national tourist centers, Samana required a series of infrastructural additions and improvements to make the region uh, accessible and amenable to visitors. As a result, the town of Samana, again, was forcefully destroyed in 1971 to make way for these infrastructural improvements imposed by the Dominican state that intended to modernize local space. This infrastructural makeover responded to the nation's economic and social project to transition from an agricultural economy to a service industry economy with tourism at its center. This moment signaled the beginning of many economic, political, social, and cultural transformations taking place in rural towns across the nation, but specifically in this case, Samana. In much of my work, I delve into the cultural, political, and economic effects of this renovation process and the displacement and disenfranchisement of much of the Samana population, and specifically the African-American community that had existed and arrived on the shores of Samana in 1824. Although similar efforts to modernize coastal spaces occurred across the country, uh, none of them were implemented as thoroughly as in Samana. Therefore, I investigate the process of modernization through which this renovation was achieved and the factors that required eminent domain laws and the use of forceful state tactics to make this transition a reality. 
I would argue that these interventions into Samana were implemented forcefully as a result of the racial, linguistic, and cultural differences of the region and attempt to shatter the autonomy and community-centered ethic of the Samana society. The shift in investment towards tourism signaled the new relation of the state to local elites and international capital. Transformations that were implemented marked an increase in state intervention into local affairs and a rapid decrease in the function of civil society institutions that had been developed over years of struggle. As the community Samana went through substantive changes and was forced to relinquish many, as, many of its cultural practices and spaces of organizing, as a result of Samana's distance from the urban centers of power, tourism development would be an immediate way for it to become integrated into the national, economic, and political structures of the Dominican Republic. The population occupying these tourist spaces were not part of the plans for the development of the region, but could not be made to disappear. Rather than partners, rural communities were recipients of the modern turn and were, and were to be relegated to the outer boundaries of these tourist centers. As part of this tourism renovation project, the first paved road connecting Samana to the rest of the Dominican Republic was completed in the 1970s. In addition, an international airport and a cruise ship port facility were built to prepare for the expected increase in the arrival of the tourists to the region. That international airport was actually built too short with, uh, with not enough materials and such, and so actually was never able to operate in that correct manner. And the cruise ship port himself um, was actually put in an area where it was not deep enough for the cruise ships to come in, and so never function in that, uh, in that reality either. In the process of restructuring, many community spaces were occupied and destroyed, and local institutions such as the, such as the Club Peninsular, uh, social club, two Masonic lodges, and the Samana Music Academy were completely dismantled in the process. These actions were indicative of larger tendency towards authoritarian rule in the Dominican Republic. Three regions that were initially selected in which to develop tourism infrastructure projects were Puerto Plata, Boca Chica, and Samana. These investments in these regions, state incentives were given to the hotel industries, and all private investments received extensions of 100% value on rent and import costs. Private tourist investments in the Dominican Republic were made tax deductible for a period of 10 years with the possibilities of extending deduction to 15 years, right? So there's this whole process of the state trying to incentivize uh, different industries to come into Puerto to Samana specifically, but Puerto Plata and Boca Chica, right? And to a development of this infrastructure required the acquisition of land, use of coastal land specifically, which of course prompted the displacement of populations that inhabited regions deemed important for these tourism endeavors. This displacement was legally sanctioned by the newly established Eminent Domain Law Number 153, which allowed for the expropriation of lands for reason of public utility. In Samana, Law 153 was used to expropriate land where state finance hotels were to be constructed for the airport, for the maritime port itself in Arroyo Barril, and to build a new road to the region. Much of the land that was appropriated belonged to the African-American descendants who held legal title at the time. Many of these cases, which demand compensation for the use and appropriation of those lands, are still pending in the courts. The forced removal of families was done within the confines of the township of Samana. Those living in the rural areas adjacent to the town were spared. There was no process of local consultation, and the swiftness of the endeavor and the violence of the regime stifled any type of collective organizing. The renovation of the town would continue in stages for the next two years until it was completed. Without distinction, the residents of the town were forcibly removed from their homes and placed in temporary housing in makeshift wooden encampments. The transfer of all the families to the barracks instantaneously and momentarily equalized the town, destroying the social distances that existed between the different segments of Samana society. Um, like many elder Samaneses, uh, Leticia Wilmore, who was a community historian, was conflicted by the turn of events brought on by the renovation itself. She went on to say that uh, to say of the government officials who ordered the destruction of the town. They did what they felt like. You'd rather sell the house than for them to take it away. If you could sell your home, you sell your house and go somewhere. Plenty of folks had nowhere to go. They destroyed the homes. The people didn't want this to happen. Sorry. A neighbor said to stole many of their things, her antiquities and her mom's belongings in the confusion. The state took everything from her house. For Leticia, the threat to Samana originated directly from the state and had been imposed by political power. Other elders like Tata also had a critical view of the changes transpiring locally and like many in the community, she complained about the changes that Samana society had, un had undergone. In an inter interview, she smiled and reminisced about Samana of her youth. The smoke, the lack of water and electricity, it was a disaster. It generated much bad feelings amongst the people. When they destroyed the people's homes, many of them lem left Samana. All of those that could emigrate did so. If you had kids en route to the university, 
all those all those who could not continue living without local work, they left and got jobs elsewhere, never returning. You really had to love Samana to have stayed here or not had any other option. Samana residents were not able to save their homes, but they did manage to save the churcha or AME church uh, through local protest. They knew, they said, no, we can't take down this church, and so they left it, whereas by Leticia Wilmore. The church became the only space for Samana residents to converge during the reconstruction without interference from local authorities. The destruction of the town tore apart neighborhoods that had formed over time around religious and ethnic affiliations. These neighborhoods and relations were based on strong historical bonds of years of trust and interaction between families. Families removed from their homes would receive a one-room barracón or a barrack to be shared by its members. Witnesses com commented on how there seemed to be no order to the mayhem of allocating the small provisional homes in these barracks. Their backyards and courtyards gone, a small outhouse in the back was to be shared by multiple families. For many of the families, the conditions of the space were insufficient and protests erupted from different segments of the community. To appease the protests, the state, the Dominican state offered disgruntled families the option of being compensated for their homes. As the rates of compensation were much lower than the value of their homes and land, most families were forced to wait to receive new home built by the state. Others, rather than waiting reconstruction, took the low compensation offered by the state and moved to Santo Domingo, where displaced Samaneses began their own neighborhood. In the town's rebirth, cement structures were built instead of wooden homes. The pricey mahogany and cedar wooden slabs that had been culled from the hills of Samana were carted off and served as the building blocks for other rural towns. During the process of reconstruction, all private and religious schooling was halted and only the public school remained in operation. Large amounts of state and municipal resources were dispersed for these infrastructural projects. A new elementary school, a new high school complemented the construction of a hospital, airport, public park, water sanitation infrastructure, and a cruise ship port in Arroyo Barril. A new road connecting Santo Domingo to Samana was also constructed in hopes of increasing the flow of tourists to the region. Two large state-owned hotels were built, one on the island of Cayo Levantado and the other on the hillside above the town overlooking Puerto Escondido Beach. After its construction of the Puerto Escondido Hotel, the community lost access to the beach that had been used for years for activities and weekend outings. The new town would have an oceanfront walkway and a cement bridge that connected the outer quays. The design for both the walkway and the bridge were initially concocted in plans commissioned by French General Ferrand in 1808 during the attack against the Haitian Revolution. As an object of the archive, the plans designed by Ferrand provided a point of reference, a truth that was appropriated and reimagined by various historical subjects. Through the dismantling of the community's social, cultural, and political structures and stripping away local decision-making power, the Dominican state achieved the control that previous governments had not had. Samana's destruction established a pattern of subservience between the state and the locality. In one of the few articles published in the national papers, the editors wrote about the role of Balaguer in the region. He destroyed a town, its symbols, and its memories to build the grotesque elephant of cement, deformed for the purpose of tourism and indifferent to a public opinion that was terrorized. The intellectuals are accomplices and the elites have always turned their backs to our identity. Dozens and dozens of Samaneses have decided to migrate and some of those who stayed died of sorrow, pain, and nostalgia. Photos from private collections and published postcards of the town helped to create a visualization of how it was prior to the destruction. These images allow us to view the marked physical changes to which the town was submitted. The forcefully initiated social engineering project in Samana was not able to displace localized identities that have been produced over years of struggle and agent agentive processes that created this place of Samana. The families who withstood the town's destruction experienced extensive changes in the three-year period from 1971 to 73. These state-led changes linger in the minds of Samana's inhabitants, many who lament and share the memory of loss at the changes that came to their community. The demise of many community-based inst institutions had a crippling effect on the organization of local civil society from which it has yet to recover fully. The memory of that experience is part of their history, their trauma, and their hesitancy to trust. This process promises to repeat itself as tourism has become a central economic input to the Dominican state, which continues to relegate the needs of Samaneses to the margins while developing the local space for the needs of seasonal visitors. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jensen Ortiz. I'm a librarian at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute Archives and Library. Before I begin, I would like to thank Sofia Manegro for inviting me and organizing this panel. 
This project began in 2019 when Professor Ryan Mann Hamilton, who teaches at LaGuardia Community College in CUNY and is also a member of the Institute for Social Ecological Research, approached us with the idea of digitizing and preserving documents he came across in Samana at the St. Peter's Evangelical Church. We began discussing possible ways to fund this project initially, and we also came up with uh, thinking about a larger project of a digital community archive and exhibition for the area of Samana. Involved in these discussions were was Professor Sara Ponte, who's the chief librarian, and she proposed that we apply for the Salam Award for Collaborative Projects. Uh, Salam is actually called the Seminar on the Acquisition of Latin American Library Materials, which Sarah is a member of. Uh, during this time, Ryan put out a call to local community members to see if they were interested in collaborating, also facilitating additional documents for the collection. So on May 22nd, um, we received notice that we won the award uh, to begin this first phase of digitizing and preserving the documents at the St. Peter's Evangelical Church. This is a photo of the team uh, of myself, Ryan, and Sophia. We worked on site at the St. Peter's Evangelical Church uh, for a week from August 22nd, uh, from July 22nd to August 2nd uh, in 2019. Our first day in Samana, we visited local community members, talked to them about what we were, what we were doing in Samana uh, that week. And also uh, pictured here is Pastor Jerny Feliz and his wife of the St. Peter's Evangelical Church. We were surveying the documents that they had stored in the suitcase and also putting together uh, a plan to action uh, for the week, uh, for the work that we were going to do. So uh, prior, so after we surveyed the documents of the St. Peter's Evangelical Church, we began the process of sorting and organizing these documents. As you could see, we were able to put together these documents into five categories, uh, beginning with baptismal records, marriage records, birth records, church communication and finance records. And also uh, there were these multi-volume of official registries of baptism and marriage records at the church, uh, which were oversized and we put those to the side. Um, it took us various hours to classify the documents by category and then organize them uh, by decade beginning in 1900. The following day, we began the digitization process. Um, we were able to bring over two flatbed scanners, uh, about 100 archival sleeve covers, uh, acid-free file folders, and archival boxes for the preservation purposes of uh, the church um, and the documents we were working with. Um, I also demonstrated to Ryan and Sophia how to properly handle and repair some archival documents that were tearing apart. Um, we were able to use some acid-free tape uh, to repair some edges to the documents, but ultimately we placed the ones that were really fragile and some of the archival sleeve covers we brought over. In addition to that, as we were scanning, we were scanning these documents into TIFF formats. Uh, reason being is because we were uh, incorporating these into storing them into an external hard drive uh, that we brought over from the CUNY DSI library. And we're going to use these files later uh, to incorporate them into the community digital archive that we would like to construct. And also, um, we, I taught them to incorporate some file naming schemes uh, for some of the documents we were scanning. Uh, it's important to identify what's a marriage record, what's a baptismal record, so there's no confusion later on when we were when we meet again to uh, think about. Uh, what metadata standards we're going to be using for these documents, digital documents, uh, and also for the organization of the online repository. Uh, furthermore, um, there was a digital camera that was brought on the trip. Um, we were taking pictures of the oversized items that we couldn't fit in the scanner. And so those digital images were also incorporated 
uh, into the hard drive and we ultimately um, were able to uh, train someone. Uh, the daughter of the pastor, Jeanine Feliz, uh, was around during the whole digitization process of that week and she was able to uh, learn from us uh, how to digitize and also make available uh, the files that we were uh, scanning. Uh, furthermore, um, on our last day, we were able to make contact and visit the Mother Beto a &E Church. The Mother Beto a &E Church uh, had a series of documents that go back to the late 1870s. Um, we spent the day uh, with the church pastor on Thursday and on Friday, uh, we were able to take a look at the initial documents and begin organizing the documents into similar categories as the St. Peter's Church. We didn't have the same amount of resources we had towards the end of the week. We were only able to digitize the oldest documents dating back to 1910 and organize and place the rest in boxes for future work. We estimated that there are an additional 300 documents that should be conserved and digitized. Um, we left a second flatbed scanner for the Mother Beto A &E Church so they could begin scanning the remaining documents. Um, and this plays into the importance of what's, what, what's the work that's left to be done at the, on the historic uh, migration of African Americans to Haiti and the Dominican Republic. There are many documents still around that need to be preserved and, and documented. I think um, those are the Mother Beto AME Church were an example of the work that needs to be done. Uh, Ryan was able to uh, visit the municipality in Samana, unfortunately, access to those records. Uh, the Catholic Church has some additional records. Uh, individual homes as well uh, may have records and photographs and other materials that can be incorporated into a much larger collection. But ultimately, uh, this, this will contribute to a larger narrative on the historic and, and cultural significance of Samana and we hope that uh, the documents we brought back, we can make them available uh, through an online repository and an exhibition in conjunction with whatever, whatever is left out there to be incorporated. Um, that's really the work that we hope to uh, aspire to do uh, in the next phases of this project. Uh, lastly, we were able to scan over 500 documents in a week. Uh, and like I mentioned, there's still many documents to be digitized and preserved. Uh, this is a picture of what the end product looked like. Uh, all the documents are in archival folders and are categorized by the different uh, type of records we came across. On the right, you see about these, which is baptism, notes, and, and acts. Uh, some of the, the memos of the church and additional documents were separated. Um, and this was uh, a way for us to help them preserve those documents. Uh, they also kept uh, a copy of the digital files of all of these documents that you see here in boxes. Uh, and those will be made available to community members. And, and that's really the work we would like to do uh, going forward uh, when we do go back uh, to work with other churches and individuals who would like to make available those records that they have. So lastly, if anyone would like to contact me uh, about this project, uh, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, and thank you again for listening to this presentation. All right, so we have about 10 minutes left and I am going to briefly share my screen and present my, um, my paper live. Let me just pull up presentation.
can everybody see my screen? I'll take a thumbs up if possible. Awesome. Okay. So thank you to all my panelists for their wonderful presentations and for being so gracious with their time um, and teaching and mentoring a budding scholar like myself. I learned so much from these papers. That being said, this paper here is a reflection of all that I've learned from my panelists and the questions that still remain as I prepare a dissertation prospectus on black women within this African-American immigration movement. As we have seen research on African-American immigration to Haiti, pardon as I jump around my present. As we have seen research on African-American immigration to Haiti and the Dominican Republic is both varied and incomplete. The question of women poses one of the largest gaps in this scholarship. Where are African-American women, some of the most organized and fierce abolitionists in this immigration movement? What roles did Haiti and Dominican women play in inviting and integrating African-American immigrants? How did African-American women integrate themselves into Haitian and then Dominican society? What does studying Black women reveal to us about the gendered contours of the Black radical tradition? Searching for Black women in this immigration movement requires that we engage, as Cydia Hartman put it, the archive and the limits it sense on what we know and whose perspective matters and who is endowed with the gravity and authority of being a historical actor. The following glimpses I offer into these women's lives center their words when found. In the absence of Black women's writing, I reconstruct travel narratives around these Black women's migration using fragments from the archive and close narration. Essentially, I read their travel and as a self-liberating praxis of leaving the slaveholding U.S., that act of leaving as a text itself. In this paper, I introduced three Black women that took it upon themselves to realize their dreams of Black liberation on Hispaniola and the travel narratives that provide us glimpses into their journeys. Let us begin with Serena Baldwin. Serena Baldwin, unfortunately not pictured here, this is just what I like to imagine she might look like, um, embarked on a journey in the fall of 1824 I'm so sorry. I don't know why this does this to me because I'm not playing. Okay. Oh Lord. Embarked on a journey on um, in the fall of 1824 with their family and thousands of other African Americans en route to Haiti from the U.S. mainland. Young Serena was an articulate and well-educated young girl. In New York, she attended the African free schools that trained and regularly tested in arithmetic, US geography, and English grammar. Abigail Mott speaks of the success of African free schools in biographical sketches and interesting anecdotes of persons of color. Mott writes, quote, the effects of education were as visible upon the consonances of these children as they are upon that that are white the consonances beaming with intelligence and liveliness of their spirits or their apparent happiness was a subject of universal remark, end quote. Mott's text also contains several letters by African-American travelers, Serena included. In September 29 of 1824, Serena writes to her teacher in New York, writes her teacher in New York upon her arrival in the city of Santo Domingo within the Republic of Haiti, quote, dear teacher, with pleasure, I hasten to inform you of our safe arrival in Santo Domingo after a passage of 21 days. Serena recants her difficult voyage and the friendly welcome she and her family received from the generals in command. 14-year-old Serena also writes about her perceptions of freedom on the island. Among, quote, among our good wishes, you wish I may live and enjoy freedom, dear teacher. If ever there is a country where liberty dwells, it is here. It is a blessing enjoyed alike by all men without respect to fortune or color. I cannot be otherwise as our motto is liberty and equality, end quote. The Brotherhood Haiti espoused here extended to a young black girl. The question lies, if young Serena felt the universal rights of Brotherhood Haiti espoused, and if they were extended to a young black girl like herself. The only other glimpse of Serena I found is in a follow-up letter to her teacher on June 30th of 1825. In it, she wrote, quote, on the New Year's Day, which is the anniversary of our independence, we went to the parade, end quote. 
Already identifying as a Haitian woman herself, Serena wrote of our independence, perhaps because she truly felt free in her family's 12 acre farm a quarter mile from Santo Domingo. While the archive has yet to grant me another glimpse into Serena's life, I wonder if her feeling of freedom persisted. Did Haiti continue to live up to a young black girl's idea of liberation? Unlike Serena, in the case of Anta, we have none of her words to consider how she viewed freedom. Anna Madagijin Ajaya Kingsley, African princess, Florida slave, and plantation owner by Daniel L. Schaefer, historicizes the life of Anta, an emancipated African woman from modern day Senegal. Anta's African name, rather than Anta's enslaved name, is, here, is used here to bring attention to the erasure of Anta's autonomy. In some earlier work, I have argued that Schaefer's biography of Anta's, of Anta's life frequently ignores, silences, and conveniently sidesteps Anta's subjectivity as an enslaved and free Black woman. Significantly, the text avoids the unequal intimacy Anta was forced to share with her white husband. The absence of violence, sexual assault, and coercion in this biography crafts a narrative of Anta's enslaver, emancipator, and common law husband, Stephanie Kingsley Jr., as a benevolent master. Schaefer uncritically glosses over and at times hails Stephanie's idea ideas of a three caste system that encourage interracial relationships and the manumission of enslaved people to make, quote, free colored peoples your allies and enlist their assistance in controlling the much larger numbers whose labor was coerced, end quote. Anta's biography reads more like a story on Sephaniah's benevolence than one that brings, quote, a wider understanding to the lives of enslaved and free women, end quote, that it supposedly promises. Schaefer's inability to account for the coercion in Anta's unequal marriage likely arises from his exclusive use of Sephaniah's words. Even though Schaefer alludes to Anta's literacy and the letters she writes to her daughters in Florida from, from Puerto Plata in the 1840s, Anta's biography is predominantly compiled from Sephaniah's journals, letters, ledgers, and details from his two books. However, Stephanie's ledger is riddled with these silences, gaps that muzzle Anta's 30-year-old screams once she likely bellowed in refusal of Stephanie's nearly 60-year-old body forcibly injecting the seed that engendered young, jo young John Maxwell in 1824. What would Anta's migration to Dominican society look like if we considered the power in the production of history that Trujillo asked us to think about? I offer the following narration of Anta's immigration to Puerto Plata as an entryway into which history, as an entryway that history has denied us thus far, a serious consideration of her thoughts on liberation. Anta Marigia Jaya Kingsley's tongue tingled as she took in the taste of salt from the Atlantic breeze on her lips. Her youngest son, John Maxwell Kingsley, rested on her lap. Their bodies swayed to the rhythm of the ship as she caressed his dark, silky curls, a testament to his mixed Yolof and white ancestry. It had been 32 years since Anta had left the pulse of had felt the pulse of the Atlantic Ocean. The sound of the water thrashing against the ship propelled her back to that original voyage. Then she was as terrified. Then she was a terrified 13-year-old girl in the cargo hold of Sally, a slave ship that departed the West Indian, the West African coast, and docked in Cuba in 1806. Now, now, in 1838. She was a freed woman, a, health, a wealthy Florida property owner and wife of her enslaver and emancipator. Yet all she had secured could not prevent her current uncertainty of having to start a new life on a foreign shore. Anta was again at the mercy of a new geography. However, unlike the recently incorporated US Florida territory that she had come from, this new land promised unbridled black freedom. After days at sea, Anta finally spotted a shore in the horizon. They had arrived to their new home in Puerto Plata, a port providence in the Dominican colony within unified Haiti. In this colony of the first Black Republic, Anta and, jo and John joined thousands of free Black immigrants from the US, whose trips were also prompted by white benevolent colonists and Black people's self-determination to be fully free.
while there is so much to be discovered and work to be done beyond the archive, as well as within it, on the lives of Serena and Anta, their cases are fortunate ones, for we have their names. So many more Black women in the African American immigration movement remain nameless, only mentioned by station or relation, as is the, as is the case of an African American entrepreneur in Jane McManus Casnew's book, Our Winter Eden. An influential woman, Casnew, pictured here, was a seasoned author, journalist, and close confidant of US, of US presidents, Ulysses S. Grant and Vice President Aaron Burr, to name a few as well as architect of the term manifest destiny that we all know so well. Prior to its publication, the chapters of this book can be seen in James' numerous articles published in the New York Herald and the New York Sun, both published during the, both uh, articles published both prior to the Civil War. In addition, James' advocacy can also be seen in the three essays she authored when that were read by fellow land speculator Joseph Fabens before the American Geographical and Statistical Society, as well as her correspondence when she advised President Andrew Johnson, Secretary of State W. H. Seward, and Secretary of the Interior James Harlan on Caribbean affairs. Given the sphere of influence Jane operated in, this book had a targeted and powerful audience. In Our Winter Eden, Jane subordinated Dominican's labor practices to those of African Americans. Her agenda to establish African Americans as civilizing agents were as civilizing agents for the quote, backwards and lazy, end quote, Dominican people, grants us entry into the domestic sphere of African American women in this bordering tourist economy. During Jane's stay in the 19th century, in a 19th century Airbnb of sorts. She interacts with, quote, the owner of the cottage, a widow, the daughter of a colored immigrant from Virginia, and in right of her father, claims to be a, quote, born citizen of the United States, end quote. While this widow is never given a name, she lodges Jane and her group of fellow white US citizens as they go about searching for suitable land, plots of land to purchase. It is significant that the widow considers herself a US citizen, given she is one generation removed from the African American immigration to the island. The widow's national claim is grounded in language, culture, religion, and economic ambition to host mostly US travelers. Jane writes that, quote, the widow speaks fairly good English, is a devout member of the Protestant church, and keeps her lodgings in strict reserve for quality people from the United States, end quote. While the widow feels a kinship with her US travelers, she also likely sees the economic advantage of this kinship. Our Winter Eden forefronts what Jane and her fellow white speculators seek to gain in Dominican geographies. What is left at the margins is what savvy African-American descended women are gaining in this nexus of power early access to what will become a massive tourist economy that which today dominates the GDP of the island nation. Jane writes, the widow, quote, gives them the worth of their money in neat meals and cheerful attendance, end quote. It is significant to know that the widow's cheerful attendance is a predominant feature of successful hospitality economies. This analysis does not aim to offer a reductive self-interested reading of the widow or African-American women. Rather, my aim here is to consider how African-American women are socially positioned as a bridge in, in the period of speculative US empire prior to the Spanish-American War. African-American women have retained the language, religion, national pride, and culture of their US origins. They are culturally and linguistically positioned to introduce novice US travelers to this new frontier. In the absence of having been granted the plots of land, Haitian President Jean-Pierre Boyer granted thousands of their African-American husbands, fathers, and sons. These African American, we must wonder if these African-American women descendants were see this budding tourism industry as a chance to attain <laughs> the economic liberation that Haiti had promised them. To conclude, Ashri Moraga's imminent collection, The Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, posits to us, quote, I am a woman with a foot in both worlds, and I refuse the split, all fuses to create a, polit a politic born out of necessity. 
end quote. I leave you all to consider whether African-American women living in Dominican society during the rise of US empire in the region were operating out of this politic of necessity within what Jane and other white expansionists had dubbed a new US frontier. Thank you. <sighs> all right, I definitely went over time, um, but I believe that there's still eight minutes before the next panel if anybody has any questions at all or comments. <laughs>